Hello, how are you doing? So in this video I thought I'd tell you about my journey so you can see the logic behind the learn guitar experience that is spy tunes. Most of my students over the years have not been beginners but instead people who have uh, played for a long time but they gotten stuck and decided they want to have another go at this and this time do it properly. So I guess that's my target audience. Typically most people end up there and I think with my experience I can relate to the various pitfalls learning guitar comes with. Alright, so let me tell you about my journey then. So I started out playing classical guitar in school at the age of 7 or 8 and that's when you start school in Sweden where I'm from. Uh, I had an older lady teaching me really simple classical pieces in a group class. After a few years she was replaced with a younger guy who played pub gigs and he introduced me to the songbook, so that's lyrics and chords of famous songs, no tab or sheet music. So I went from reading simple music on the stave to playing simple chords above lyrics of songs I kind of heard on the radio. My parents weren't musicians and they didn't even have a record collection, so these once a week guitar lessons was basically all I had. Uh, none of what these two teachers showed me was difficult or complicated. Uh, being very naive, I thought uh, playing guitar was pretty easy, but that's just because I didn't really know any better and I was never challenged. This is a trick I've seen a lot of beginner teachers use, actually. Uh, if you never challenge your student, they can remain at this stage and you have a weekly income for years. So this is uh, went on for about uh, four or five years. I made very little progress, but you know I suppose I enjoyed it. Uh, at twelve, I started taking electric guitar lessons from a private teacher. This guy was your uh, typical musician who played in a wedding band on the weekends and had private students in the week. He'd been to MI in Los Angeles and was actually roommates with a guy called Frank Gambale. Maybe you heard of him. Uh, he invented a speed picking method during that time, so we worked on that for a while. We also practiced modes, we played some solos, you know, standard stuff you're doing once a week on a guitar lesson in the late 80s. Uh, looking back, the main thing missing was context. We didn't play complete songs or practice stuff related to songs. Um, it was all very separate. Now, I didn't really listen to much music, I just I just played exercises, basically. Uh, I could play three note per string patterns like Frank Gambale had designed, really fast, but I couldn't apply it because I had no suitable context. And, uh, I mean, I did have a, a garage band with some friends, but my solos never worked <laughs> very well with the songs and that we played, And although they were really fast and loud. Um, if I went to a music shop to try an amp, it sounded like I was uh, pretty decent, but really, if you put me in a band, I would have sounded like a, a, a beginner, you know? Um, since I didn't understand enough about actual music and didn't play that much with the band, I wasn't really aware of my own level. It's like a typical bedroom player, basically. I thought I was much better than I actually was. This is uh, still the case with a lot of players these days that I come across. They, they're technically decent. It appears as if they're good, but really because they don't have much context or real-world experience, you put them in a band and they just disappear into the background until, you know, it's time to solo and then they're too loud and too fast, you know, just, just like I was. So this goes on for another four or five years until I finish school and at 16 I go to college. I find this music college and it's one of those uh, rock pop places that started to pop up in the mid-90s. Here I get a teacher that played jazz and uh, he tuned his guitar in fourths so his scales were more symmetrical and he actually played a, a double neck guitar tapping chords with the left hand on, uh, on the top neck and then he's playing melodies on the bottom neck tapping. Um, this is about as far removed from the Beatles and Jimi Hendrix as you can get. So I spent three years with him playing modes and licks by his favorite players, which were like, you know, Pat Metheny and George Benson. And we do things like spend an entire lesson improvising with Lydia, or you know, we play using free improvisation where there will be no harmonic rules. And this was just way too advanced for me. I, I, I could just about get away with it, but really I should have been playing simpler things well before I... I got to this stage. 
Uh, again, I see this with loads of young players these days. They, they play things that they don't really understand and can just about get away with. You put them in a real world scenario and it, it all falls apart, you know, especially rhythm playing. It's, it's usually a disaster. So after college, uh, I'm now 18 or 19, I figure I need real world experience here. So I start gigging in bars, uh, tourist resorts around Europe, cruise ships, etc. You know, I'll be in Greece in the summer, I'll be in the Alps in the winter and on a cruise ship in between. Most of this work was with duos playing acoustic guitar as well as singing. I, I figured I needed to make up for this lack of knowing normal songs and I desperately needed some real world experience. And this was uh, good because it provided me with context but I missed out on a couple of vital details. Because I was um, singing, bringing the PA, booking the gig, talking to the audience, taking the payment, driving the car, negotiating the next booking and you know I, I didn't have the headspace to focus on what I was playing so the guitar part became my last priority and this was a huge mistake I so wish someone would have pointed this out to me you know at the time that would have been really helpful the advice I needed was uh, stop singing focus on what you're playing practice in the day what you're playing at night and aim to develop your parts if I'd done that I could have stayed with gigging and developed as I went along what I've learned since then is that every musician that gets good does so from focusing on their playing gigging and practicing stuff related to the songs they play most importantly they don't do much else as soon as they get distracted and lose focus the playing takes a back seat and they stop developing even if they even if they gig three nights a week so I met I met so many musicians in the last 20 years and every single one of them that has become great has done the same thing you know they gig they practice they work on their repertoire they focus on playing what they played yesterday to be even better today so anyway I didn't do that I got distracted and after six or seven years of gigging I actually went uh, back to music school this time in England so it was another rock pop music college for three years and here I met what I can only describe as the best guitar player and probably teacher as well in the world you probably heard of him it's the unbelievable Guthrie Govan this guy is so good it's it's mind-blowing I spent three years with him and apart from being constantly blown away I realized that the main problem with guitar lessons is not the students ambition or the teachers ability it's actually the format so Guthrie has an answer to every question you could possibly have. How do you play like Jimi Hendrix? Oh, it's just like this. Boom, note for note. It sounds exactly the same. It's ridiculous. Any detailed question you have, he knows and he tells you straight away. There's no like, oh, I have to think about that for a bit. He just knows it. What about Alan Holdsworth? Oh, it's just this. To be in the same room as Guthrie, you know, it's being able to ask him anything. It's, it's quite the experience. But then the lesson ends and uh, you're there with this impossible question to answer, which is, uh, where do I start? <laughs> and uh, what was that thing he said about Alan Holdsworth's scale pattern again, you know? So after some time, I realized that I had to just sit down and uh, decide what I'm going to work on. Make it a practice routine and stop thinking so much about this. It was time to, as uh, Nike says, just do it. So this is 2003. And three years after a book called The Caged Guitarist had come out. And uh, everyone was talking about this. Few read the book, obviously. But everyone acted as if they understood it. And I found the book and realized that all it meant, really, was that instead of position 1 to 5, we called them by their cage name. So this may seem irrelevant, but... It really is truly revolutionary. So me being bilingual by moving from Sweden to England and speaking a lot of English and thinking English, I, I really understand how important language is to thinking. Because I, I think in English, right? Which, uh, that, I, that was a really important part for me to understand why this cage system is so important. We, we think in English, so by thinking, oh, that's a C-shaped chord, that's much better than thinking that's position three. 
it's, it's just a language thing. I also found a book called Tonal and Rhythmical Principles by a jazz piano professor called John Mahegan. So putting these two books together, I came up with a practice routine which uh, eventually led to my self-eliminating practice routine or the SCPR and uh, Cordacus as well. I presented this developed caged and Roman numeral system to the college along with a bunch of chromatic exercises I developed inspired by drummer's rudiments and you find these in the SCPR as well on the on the member site. Anyway, the, re the result was that they offered me a job as a teacher and I rewrote their uh, guitar manual into Caged and uh, would now teach a few days a week during my second and third year as a student. Uh, I also started writing a column for Guitar Techniques magazine and all this was a a big turning point for me, you know. My playing had uh, improved enormously now that I had uh, names for my chord and scale shapes and understood chord theory using Roman numerals properly. I also played in several bands which gave me context. I wrote songs with these bands which uh, seemed remarkably easy now that I could find my way around the fretboard or develop a melody by reharmonizing it or just manipulate the rhythm or, you know, whatever. It was as if things had finally fallen into place, basically. But one problem was still there, and that was the format of these face-to-face uh, -face lessons. Even with the best guitar player in the world, Guthrie Govan, there was two massive parts missing here. And the first was that you couldn't see the lesson again since it was live. And the second problem was that because Guthrie can answer any question and you got like 30 people with their mind blown in, in one room, there's going to be a lot of questions, you know. So the structure of each lesson and the course as a whole was not great. And as I mentioned, you couldn't play it again. That was like the main thing, really. I mean, you know, don't get me wrong here. I was, uh, it was very entertaining and I'm very grateful to have been a student of Guthrie's. You know, he's, he's amazing. But anyway, this led me to the conclusion that um, what this uh, music college needed to do was film the lessons and offer this as a video library to all future students. This is uh, 2005 now, so just before YouTube appears. Streaming is extremely expensive and the college, I mean, don't want to use computers. So, so I left. I found an investor and I set up my first company to do video guitar lessons in 2006. After this huge investment we built a film and recording studio, we hired editors, uh, engineers, writers. We even had a, a front desk girl to answer the phone. And uh, there were way too many board meetings with a bunch of crazy directors. and. After about a year, this company fell apart. The website shut down only a few months after launch. And the main problem was that streaming at this point in time was too expensive. I think it was like $5 a gig or something. And now it's like less than a cent. So it's an insane difference. Uh, it was the right place, but definitely the wrong time. Uh, the following year, 2007, I thought, okay, this is crunch time now. I'm, if I'm going to get anywhere with uh, teaching, I have to get on with it. So I started SpyTunes, put all my song videos on YouTube and wrote a bunch of ebooks for my scale theories and practice routines and thinking that, you know, the variety of the songs will prove that the scale and chord theories work for any style of music, basically. Um, it was just me and Justin and a couple of Australian guys called uh, Next Level Guitar on YouTube and I got millions of plays on my videos, I got loads of traffic to the site and as a result I sold lots of ebooks and, you know, seemingly everything was uh, working out. So I expanded and I recorded songs by Jimi Hendrix and ACDC and Led Zeppelin and this triggered uh, a copyright issue with YouTube and they shut down my account. So I uploaded the songs that weren't banned to new accounts, but the momentum was gone and the traffic didn't come back so, to what I was used to. So this is now 2009 and 
I join a band playing bass, we get a record deal, and Spy Tunes goes into hibernation, basically. I, I never got uh, paid for my YouTube videos since all the ad revenue goes straight to the copyright holder. My ebooks are now being spread over emails and in forums, and I'm way too busy to care about it, to be honest. I'm touring with this band, and we're supporting big named acts, and we're playing festivals, we're making music videos, we're going to photo shoots, and all thinking we're gonna make it. And a few years later, the band is dropped uh, by the label. And I'm back to playing weddings again, thinking about how can I make Spy Tunes work. And if I'm going to have a go at this again, I want to get everything right. And I've been having a bunch of super fans during this time, and uh, they've been mainly focusing on the SCPR. So they are, they're all great at playing scales, but they struggle with pulling it into real-world context. You know, just like um, when I learned how to play Frank Gambale's three-note-per-string patterns... They practice, but without context. So I'd like to think that chord acoustics is much better than the three note per string patterns, but at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. Even though, you know, my, my scale patterns and music theory ideas uh, was the reason that I came online. It's uh, the reason I got my first job in the music school and felt like the big turnaround for me personally, I I could see in my students' development that something was clearly missing. And what was missing was context. And I, I realized that the answer had been there all along in, in the name of the website, uh, Spy Tunes, Study Songs. So if I was going to have another go at this, I had to get everything right this time. The format, the streaming... The context, the payments, the copyright, and the focus. And let me tell you one final story here um, that has to do with focus and success. So I spent 2012 to 2018 faffing about with uh, the structure of the courses, writing and rewriting stuff to make sure all these exercises and chord theories are integrated well with the songs. And alongside of this, I play events with soul bands and I also have this um, original rock band and we made an album and uh, did a bunch of tours for a few years before it uh, finally collapsed due to internal conflict like most bands do. Uh, one of the tours that we did was um, with this really terrible band. They were uh, bankrolled by a billionaire who basically got uh, famous musicians in and would uh, fly the band on private jets between gigs. Um, they had uh, the bass player from White Snake, the drummer from Ozzy Osbourne's band, etc. Uh, we did this tour with them for a few weeks, and the guy that played guitar was called Richard. Uh, I've never seen him before, and but he was, you know, crazy good. So the songs were awful, but Richard gave it everything. You know, every note of every song was played with so much passion. He was just like the perfect professional. He had this 100-watt uh, custom-made amp, which was louder than the PA, and loads of incredible guitars. And This guy was, without a doubt, the real deal. We played uh, venues with about 500 people capacity, and on a Tuesday night in Sunderland, with only 200 tickets sold, Richard was out there, as if his life depended on it. It was uh, it was incredible. I was standing there watching him and I was just fascinated with how much he put into this. Clearly dead-end project, you know? As soon as the billionaire got bored, the band would be over. So why am I telling him this? Well, two months later, Richard joins the biggest rock band in the world uh, for their reunion tour. Richard jo He's called uh, Richard Fortis, this guy. He, and he joined uh, Guns N' Roses. <laughs> so I look into this and it turns out that uh, he's been with Guns N' Roses when Axel did his uh, when Axel did the band on his own, basically. So just imagine how many guitar players in the world would want that gig. Everyone, all those guys in the original band lineup would know personally. Out of all of them, when the band reunites with the original lineup minus, you know, Izzy Stradlin... They picked Richard. 
So what what Richard taught me here, and I, I think this is the final piece of the puzzle. It doesn't matter what song you're playing. You need to give it 100%. No note is too small to not be considered. Excuses are for amateurs. So in 2019, I started the big rebuild. And what you see here today is the result. A step-by-step -step program without any homework. 24-7 access so we can practice together. The focus is to learn from the songs. Play along to loops for each section. Pay great attention to every note. Develop parts and actually play these songs together. And my goal is that you, by doing this, get great habits already from the start and avoid all the pitfalls that I fell into. My goal is that it doesn't take you decades to learn guitar. That you go out there and make music with other people, you know, write songs and have a great time. It doesn't have to be difficult. You just need to get on the right track and stay there on that right track. All you have to do is focus and learn from every song you play. And I hope to help you on this journey with my guitar courses. And I hope to see you on the other side.